Well, Micah 6, 8 and Royal Family Kids Camp are both great ways for us as individuals or church family to live out uh, the love and mercy and justice of the God that we know and serve. So I hope you'll find ways to be involved in both of those things. Well, if you've known me for any length of time, you know I've long been interested in and fascinated by um, ancient history. Now, I wasn't so much interested back in school when I was supposed to study it, but as an adult with chances to travel around the world, places like uh, China and Turkey and Israel with uh, long, long histories of civilization and through uh, years of teaching and studying the Bible, which is itself an ancient document that includes um, stories of people groups uh, throughout history, the Persians and the Babylonians, the Egyptians, the Greeks and Romans. So I, I've become interested in ancient history. In particular, I'm interested in, in ancient technology, how centuries ago, even millennia ago, uh, engineers found ways to build things like the pyramids of Egypt. Anybody ever visited those who are, who are here? You've seen those? Amazing. Or how they built the Colosseum in Rome. I uh, got to see that a couple of years ago. Or even the ruins of the Incas in Machu Picchu. Anybody been to South America to see those? Machu Picchu, a few people. I'm also fascinated by ancient cultures, not just by their technology. A few years ago, I just stumbled across a Discovery Channel program that happened to be about an 8,000-year-old South American culture called the Chinchoro people. Now, what made the Chinchoro people interesting was their treatment of the dead. Now, stay with me here. Uh, when someone died in that culture, they didn't uh, bury them. Uh, they didn't cremate them. They preserved them. They made mummies out of their relatives. Now, this is a little gruesome, but this is one of the Chinchoro mummies. Now, lots of cultures uh, in the ancient world made, made mummies for religious reasons or superstitious reasons, most notably the ancient Egyptians that put the mummies in giant pyramids as, as, a, as, as a way of preserving them for the afterlife. Uh, but that's not what the Chinchoro people did. When they preserved them and made their mummies, they didn't put them in tombs or in pyramids. They... They kept them uh, in their places of living. They kept them in their homes. So imagine um, keeping grandma or grandpa uh, around after the funeral, maybe in their favorite chair, maybe sitting at a place at the table. Well, that's what the Chinchoro people did. That's what historians think. Now, some of you may be thinking, well, that's nothing. I've been living with a mummified relative for years, you know, in my house. <laughs> some of you may be thinking, I, I wish that particular relative could be mummified. Now today we're going to see that the Bible tells us it's possible to be a living, breathing person, but spiritually speaking, to be nothing more than a lifeless mummy. Now we're in the third week of a series from the New Testament book of Ephesians, and it's called Built to Last. In chapter one, if you were here a couple of weeks ago, we saw the Apostle Paul, who's the author of this letter, uh, reminded the Ephesians these people living in the first century, and reminding us that we have been chosen and adopted by God the Father. We've been redeemed by the Son, Jesus Christ, and sealed then by the Holy Spirit. Then last week we saw how the Apostle Paul prayed for his dear friends in Ephesus, and in a sense for us. He prayed that they would know and have the spirit of wisdom through which they could know God, and have a relationship with him through the Holy Spirit that dwelled in them. That God would give them their glorious hope, which is their inheritance of heaven. And that they would know the immeasurable power of Christ, who is above all. Above all power and authority, even the emperor Nero, who was the Roman Caesar at that time, and Artemis, the pagan goddess of the Ephesians. Now today we begin in chapter 2 of Ephesians, and we'll see that Paul continues to dig down into uh, the depths and riches of what we call the gospel. Ephesians chapter 2, I'm going to read the first 10 verses, so follow along on the screens. He says, and you were dead. Now I've put several words or phrases in red, uh, just so you follow the flow of Paul's thought. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is at now work that now is at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we also once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God 
being rich in mercy because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Now, the red words and phrases in there sort of form the flow of the apostles' thought. You were dead, but God made us alive by grace we are his workmanship. That becomes our outline as we look this morning. First, he says, you were dead. You were dead. Some time ago, someone in our church asked me if I would uh, meet with a young couple that they knew. Um, and this couple was going through a very difficult uh, marriage struggle. The couple um, didn't go to our church, but I agreed to meet with them anyway because it was a favor to a friend I knew in the church. A couple came in to see me. They were in the mid to late 20s. Uh, wife was, um, as I recall, about eight months expectant. Uh, the guy was tall, good looking, and, and kind of full of himself, I sensed right away. Their issues were about um, his rather um, disrespectful and, in my opinion, even shameful behavior. Uh, he was going out several times at night to bars and clubs with his buddies, already had had a couple of affairs since they'd been married. Um, and on top of all of that, he was, he was pretty unapologetic. He even kind of bragged about his lifestyle choices. At one point, he said something like, what can I say? I'm a popular guy. And keep in mind, all this is right in front of his young wife who was getting ready to have their baby. And I could see the hurt on her face as he talked. And it made me mad, especially when he said, what can I say? I'm a popular guy. I, was mad. I got mad. And I said, hey, uh, I got to ask you something. I confronted him. I said, do you believe in God? He went, he looked surprised. He went, well, um, yeah, yeah, I guess so. I said, do you believe in heaven? And he went, uh, you mean that place where that people talk about after someone dies to make themselves feel better? I guess so. And I said, um, well, there is a heaven, and there is a God, and he's paying attention. And I have to tell you, it doesn't look so good for you right now. I said. <laughs> I was mad. And I, thought, I was sure he was either going to punch me or just walk out. But to his credit, he looked stunned for a second, and then he changed his tone. He eventually admitted that, yeah, he'd been a pretty lousy guy, pretty lousy husband, and he needed and wanted to make some changes. Now, Paul here is reminding the Ephesians that there was a time when it didn't look very good for them. He says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins. Now, this is interesting if you think about it, because we naturally think of death as being in the future. We all know that, that we're going to die someday, but death is in the future. Paul says, not so. He says, your death, spiritually speaking, was in the past. You were dead, he says. Now, what does he mean? The words he uses to describe spiritual death here are interesting. The, first, the word translated trespasses is a Greek word that means to fall or stumble or go the wrong way or to go where one should not go. If we were talking about uh, sports, you'd be out of bounds. If we're talking about driving, you would uh, make a wrong turn be off the road, or be in violation of a speed limit. The other word, sins, is a, a word that comes from the world of, of hunting or shooting bows and arrows. It means to miss the mark, to miss the target. If we're playing basketball, it would be shooting an air ball. So spiritual death is sin, and sin is both doing wrong things, being out of bounds, and failing to do right things. That is missing the mark. Now, sin, you would agree with me, is not a popular word in our culture. In fact, if you call someone or accuse someone of sin, some would call that hate speech in our culture today. But here's the truth. Everyone knows what it is. We just don't like to call it what it is. Think about what's happening right now in our news cycle. 
A doctor is accused and has admitted to sexually molesting over 150 pe- uh, women who came to him as their doctor. We all know what that is. That's sin. That's sin on a personal level. The relentless accusations of sexual assault and harassment in Hollywood, that's sin. We recognize what that is. Racial injustice, that's sin on a societal or cultural level. Sex trafficking that Kim was talking about, that's sin on a societal or cultural level. When Paul says you were dead in trespasses and sins, he's saying that the fundamental problem of humanity is not a lack of education. The fundamental problem of humanity is not economic inequality. The fundamental problem is not prejudice. The fundamental problem is not politics. The problem is we were dead, spiritually speaking. Let me read this again. And you were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. I'll talk about those phrases in a moment. The spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. Now, when Paul says we were spiritually dead, he does not mean that we can't do good things. Or we can't behave in moral ways. And there are many in our culture who are confused by this. People who think, well, we, people do good things. I can do good things. Therefore, I'm okay. That's what God wants me, be, be, wants me to be a pretty good person. Being dead in sin does not mean we do not do good things. Let's go back to that doctor I talked about who's admitted to abusing all those young women. Let's say that at some time during that whole process, he was kind to his own mother. Or at some point he gave money to a charity or served in a homeless shelter. He could do good things, but those in no way change his condition. That's what Paul means when he says you were dead. We can do good things. We can behave in moral ways, but our condition, spiritually speaking, is that we were dead. In fact, the Bible goes further than that. It says we were born dead. Now, that's an interesting phrase. In Romans chapter 5, Paul says, Just as sin came into the world through one man, talking about Adam, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men because all sinned. He's saying that it's not just that we are spiritually dead because we sin. We sin because we're spiritually dead. And then he uses these phrases. We were following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air. Talk about this second phrase. Prince of the power of the air. Who is Paul talking about here? He's talking about a being the Bible calls Satan. Just a brief primer on Satan. Satan, the the name itself is the word opposer or adversary. Uh, The Bible tells us that Satan is a supernatural being who was once an angel of heaven, who became proud, set himself over against God, and was cast out of heaven. Satan now is the enemy of God and seeks to destroy all God made as good. Satan's given many names in the Bible. He's the deceiver, the destroyer, the father of lies, the accuser. And here Paul calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. Prince, notice, because although Satan has certain power and authority, his power is limited. He's prince, he's not king. There's only one king. The king is Christ who is above all. Paul's already established that. Power of the air refers to the invisible spiritual realm around us. Later in Ephesians chapter 6, we will read Paul's thoughts when he says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. That's what he's talking about, the prince of the power of the air. Satan first appears in the Bible way back at the beginning in Genesis chapter 2 as the serpent in the garden who questions God. Did God really say? And then lies to Adam and Eve, you won't die, you'll become like God. He then shows up in the great book of Job when he unsuccessfully tries to destroy a righteous man's faith by inflicting him with terrible suffering. Satan then shows up in the story of Jesus himself in the temptation in the wilderness. The Bible says the result of Satan's activity is that not only has humanity been corrupted by sin, 
but that creation itself has been corrupted by sin. In Romans 8, Paul himself writes, For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And the book of Revelation tells us the whole creation will be involved when Jesus redeems all things, new heaven and new earth. When Paul says we are following the course of this world, he's saying the work of Satan extends to the corruption of human culture. We most naturally think of things like the Holocaust of Nazi Germany, the genocide of the Pol Pot regime in Cambodia, the genocide of Rwanda, a dozen other examples throughout history. So in a sense, sin is in the very air that we breathe. That's why Paul calls Satan the prince of the power of the air. There's an interesting word in German that's used in philosophy and in theology, and the word is zeitgeist, and it means spirit of the age. Spirit of the age, not spirit of God, spirit of the age. So what is the spirit of our age, the spirit of our culture? Spirit of our age says that there is no absolute truth. There's lots and lots of talk about truth in our world today. Lots and lots of talk about truth in the social media and, 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 and when we watch TV. But the spirit of the age tells us that truth does not come from a transcendent and holy and eternal God who has revealed himself most fully through Jesus Christ and his word. The spirit of the age says that truth comes from the individual that you can create your own truth. You can decide what's true for you, and you can decide what's true for you, and you can choose your identity, and you can be like God. It's the oldest lie Satan has ever perpetrated. This is the gospel of our culture. It's the course of this world, and it's the cause and result of spiritual death. Listen to the paragraph again. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is, at, is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of body and mind, and were by nature children of wrath. Follow me here. If there is no absolute truth, if truth does not come from a transcendent and eternal God, then there is no such thing as sin doesn't exist. We are left to create our own truth, and therefore we are left to our own passions and desires. See that? See the flow of thought? Actor Woody Allen, accused of abuse by his own adopted daughter, once famously said, the heart wants what the heart wants. Satan twists the good gifts of God, uses them to destroy. Many scholars believe that the Ephesian goddess Artemis, that had the great temple of Artemis, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, uh, was seen as the goddess of fertility and prosperity by those ancient peoples, and that her worship included a form of cult prostitution. There's some debate about that. But it tells us, so the very rituals and celebrations they believed brought them life and prosperity really brought spiritual death. Paul's reminding the Ephesians of what they once were before Christ, and that's the bad news of the gospel. You were dead, he says. Secondly, he says, you have been made alive. You were dead, you have been made alive. Human, be human beings have long been fascinated with um, near-death experiences. There's a whole growing science around what are called NDEs, near-death experiences. People who experience some sort of accident, flatline during a sur surgical procedure, heart stops, breathing stops, person is clinically dead, and then resuscitated, you know, the paddles, you know, or some other way, they're brought back to life. And many of these people report similar experiences of being outside their own bodies or seeing deceased loved ones or seeing a light. Now, it's also true, by the way, that many people who have a near-death experience experience nothing like that, remember nothing at all. But some people then experience profound life change. Books have been written. You've read some of them. Movies have been made. You've seen some of them. The problem, of course 
is that none of these people were really dead. They were just mostly dead. <laughs> but NDEs only deal with the phenomenon of physical death or near physical death. Paul here is talking about something else. He's talking about spiritual death and spiritual life. And you were dead, then he says, but God. But God, being rich in mercy, and because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive. Notice those two little words. But God. The whole story of the Bible, if you simplified it way, way down, is but God. In Genesis chapter 8, God has sent judgment on the entire world through a flood due to the sinful and violent condition of humankind. Genesis 8, 1 then says, but God remembered Noah. In Genesis 50, Joseph has been sold into slavery by his own brothers. And years later, he says, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good. In Psalm 73, we read, My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, my portion forever. In Romans 5, Paul himself says, For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous man. Though perhaps for a good person one would dare to even die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And here in Ephesians 2, But God being rich in mercy. Because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace, you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works, so that no one may boast. But God made us alive. How? By grace, Paul says. Twice he uses the phrase, saved by grace. Now, the fundamental meaning of grace, we know, is gift. And that gift, of course, is what he went through in chapter 1. The gift is that we were chosen and adopted. We were redeemed. We've been sealed. The gift of grace is new life, new identity, new inheritance. Paul says that we now have with Christ raised with him, meaning the same power that raised Christ from the dead moves us from spiritual death to spiritual life. So we are now seated with him in the heavenly places. So our position has changed. Our position is no longer in trespasses and sins, but now we are in and with Christ. No longer in death, now in life. And then he says, so that in the coming ages he might show us the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness. That's another reference to our eternal inheritance. And then this verse, verse 8, for by grace you've been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It's the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. He's saying, remember, you didn't deserve it. You didn't deserve the gift. You did nothing to earn the gift. There's nothing you could ever do to earn the gift. It has nothing to do with your good works. And in the very next line, he says, but we are created for good works. And that's the third point today. We are created for good works. Most of us uh, recognize the name Charles Colson. Uh, Charles Colson gained power and fame and position as the special counsel to President Richard Nixon back in the late 60s. But he also became a household name as one of the so-called Watergate Seven uh, in the aftermath of the scandal that actually brought down the Nixon presidency. Two things happened to Charles Colson, if you've read his autobiography, at this point in his life. First, he was convicted of, a, of obstructing justice, the first member of the Nixon administration to be sentenced to prison. And secondly, almost simultaneously, through a uh, conversation with a friend who cared about him, he experienced a conversion to Christ and became a committed follower of Jesus. Colson eventually wrote a book, a best-selling book, several best-selling books. One is about, about his encounter with Christ called Born Again. Some of you have read that book. After serving seven months in federal prison, Colson eventually got out and started uh, and led the world's largest prison ministry called Prison Fellowship. Colson was smart, ambitious, driven, and successful before he met Christ. But he was spiritually dead. 
What I notice is that after he met Christ, after he experienced the grace of God that moved him from spiritual death to spiritual life, he was still smart, ambitious, driven, and successful. But he was completely repurposed, completely turned in a new direction. Does that story remind you of anyone? That's the Apostle Paul's own story. Saul of Tarsus, brilliant, driven, fearless, but spiritually dead. A selfish and arrogant and evil man on his way to harass and kill, if necessary, followers of Jesus, became Paul the Apostle. Brilliant, driven, fearless, but now reborn and completely repurposed. Verse 10 explains how this happens. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in him. Interesting words here. We are his workmanship. The Greek word means handiwork. The images of a, an artisan or an artist creating a beautiful piece of furniture or a beautiful painting, his handiwork. But created in Christ, the word created means, carries the idea of unique uh, workmanship, almost like a signature work. Like we would say of a certain piece of art, oh, that's a Picasso. Oh, that's a Rembrandt. It means someone can look at you and say, oh, that's, that's a work made by Christ. Only, only Jesus could do that. Created in Christ Jesus for good works. Now, here's what's interesting. Paul has just got done saying in no uncertain terms, you are not saved by what you do. Your works have nothing to do with the gift of grace. He turns right around. The next breath says, but you were created for good works. Here's what he's trying to tell us. First, he wants us to see the order of spiritual events. We begin in spiritual death. It's the cause and result of sin. That's where everyone begins. Everyone. Then we experience spiritual resurrection by the power of grace. Then, Good works that come out of being recreated, remade by the artist who is Christ. The gospel tells us grace comes first. Grace comes first. But secondly, the gospel tells us good works matter. Good works matter. And this is crucial. This is crucial especially for many of us who've lived a good portion of our lives being familiar with the gospel, or we've been around church for many years, because the day, and we know we can contribute nothing to our salvation. We know that it's not about works. We know it's the gift of his grace. But sometimes we can kind of treat it like, like winning the spiritual lottery, right? Like, all, all, all this for me. All this for me, and we sort of stick it in our spiritual bank account and just keep it there for ourselves. No, that's not the full gospel. The gospel's bigger than that. The gospel's more powerful than that. The gospel first changes who we are, moves us from death to life, from lost to adopted, and then it changes how we live. First who we are, identity, then how we live. The gospel always works itself out in tangible, visible ways. That's why James tells us in the book of James, chapter 2, what good is it, my brothers, if someone says he has faith but does not have, have works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is poorly clothed or lacking in daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and filled, without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? So also, faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. But someone will say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith apart from your works, and I will show you my faith by my works. And that is why we as a church do things like Micah 6.8. That's why we do things like Royal Family Kids Camp. That's why we have served the world ministry partners locally and globally. That's why we have Shepherd's Heart and Buddy Break. I can name a dozen other ministries that we do that are outside the walls of this church. Because here's the point Paul is making. Good works do not earn God's grace. Good works are produced by God's grace. Back to Charles Colson for a moment. As he came out of prison and started, make, started uh, talking about his new faith, he had many, many enemies in the world. 
And many, many people didn't, be didn't believe a word he was talking about when he came out of prison. He was a bad guy. So there was a lot of skepticism about this new Charles Colson. And he was confronted by a reporter or a former colleague about why he should be believed about this new spiritual experience. And reportedly, all Colson said was, watch me. Just watch me, he said. There's a whole world out there that's skeptical about what I'm talking about, skeptical about the gospel, who think it's all just some ancient superstition, who say, how do we know what you're saying is true? How do we know that your faith in Jesus is real? I think Paul would say together, we should say, just watch us. Just watch. Will you bow with me as I close today? Lord, we thank you today for your word. We thank you for the hard truth that without your grace, we are dead. Every single one of us, spiritually speaking. And someone here today may never have realized that. May still be thinking, yeah, well, I'm, I'm a pretty good person. You know, I, I, I do good things. That's not the point. Thank you for reminding us that without you, we're dead. And thank you for making us alive in you. And may your grace and your life become your good work in and through us. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. As always here at Chapel Street, we have our prayer team available following the benediction. If you'd like to spend a few moments in confidential prayer, just meet them here in front. We'd, they'd love to spend that time with you. On your way out, feel free to stop by the Royal Family Kids uh, kiosk out there to find out information about that ministry or pick up a Micah 6 8 flyer to hand it to someone else. We hope we'll see you here Saturday evening. Receive now the benediction. May we go now in the name of Christ our King, who moves us from death to life by His grace and who calls us to do His work in this world. Amen. Have a great day.